Kelly. And I'm Kyle Thompson. I'm Kira McGran. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. And uh, yeah, this week we are talking about xenofeminism. Uh, specifically, I think, it's, I think it's essentially the xenofeminist manifesto, A Politics for Alienation, written by a collective going by the name Laboria Cubonics. And, um, and you know what? I couldn't find a date for this. <laughs> so sometime oh. in the last couple of years, I think. <laughs> yes, quite recent. Um, absolutely. Um, and as you can hear, we're uh, joined by a guest. Um, so, Kira, uh, who are you? What are you doing here? Why are these things happening? Uh, hey, great questions. Um, <laughs> I am a game designer. I'm a queer cyborg. Um, and actually, one of the writers on this manifesto is Donna Haraway, who wrote the Cyborg Manifesto, who uh, yes. inspired my use of the gendered term cyborg. So d- deeply connected for me. And this is a cool follow up um, to that type of manifesto. That's cool. And I didn't realize that. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, I, as I said, I'm, I'm very excited about this discussion, and I think that this uh, text has a, a lot to say, uh, both to the um, gender points that you brought up, uh, and also to many of the things that we've covered on the show so far. Um, it's definitely a great follow up on our previous conversations about accelerationism, um, and. Uh, I think one of the most important things for me is this subtitle, actually, um, A Politics for Alienation, because we uh, on this show have been talking a lot about disalienation um, and about having a non-alienated workplace. And I, it, on, at first glance, it looks like these things are in complete opposition to each other. But I think there are some ways in which um, what we've been talking about on the show and what is talked about in this uh, manifesto actually overlap, overlap quite neatly. So uh, I'm, I'm really interested in talking about what we mean when we say alienation and uh, how the kinds of alienation they talk about in this manifesto are like positive in, uh, in ways that we can get on board with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, like, uh, yeah, Kira, what, what were your impressions of this, this overall piece? Oh, yeah, uh, this was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was really nervous at first, actually, um, using, using a term like xenofeminism, like, okay, it's another manifesto, what is this one about? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, you know, I dug further into it, and it focuses on a lot of the ideas that I've been reading about this summer, actually, um, uh, specifically in, in academic feminism, the ideas of how they're focusing on the Anthropocene and how it's related um, to a kind of like uh, ecofeminism um, and like all of these intersections and the ways that like humans are destroying the, the, the world and the planet right now um, and ideas of kind of like joining up with vulnerable species and defining what vulnerable is. So like I, I saw a lot of those ideas reflected in this and then I was like, oh, it's because two of the authors from those books I read are part of this collective. <laughs> yes. So, um, and it's, it was uh, Donna Haraway's Staying with the Trouble was the book that I read and Anna Singh's um, The Mushroom at the End of the World. They're both fantastic, super cool uh, feminist books about the Anthropocene. Um, and the Anthropocene is, I don't know if you know, it's like the current uh, geopolitical um, stage that we're in, like the stage of the Earth where, you know, humans do the most damage to the planet than anything else on the planet. Um, so, yeah, so I saw a lot of that, uh, concepts of, like reflected in this. I thought that was super cool, and I loved it. I love the idea of thinking about feminism in contemporary terms and creating new types of feminism to adapt to the kinds of like technology and politics, global politics that we have now. Yeah, definitely. And, um, and they, they open up here, um, with, uh, with exactly that sort of commentary. And actually before we get into this, this is one of the wonderful little quirks of the, the thing is that the paragraphs are numbered in hexadecimal. Um, yes, <laughs> so he, it's very cute. It's, it's actually it's kind of <laughs> hard to keep track. When I was, uh, later, later reading through it, I was like, Oh, what, what, what is this number? And I had to open a terminal and type it in and be like, Oh, that's, that's 12. <laughs> 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 um, but, um, yeah, the very first, uh, uh, 
section opens up with, um, and I'm quoting here, Ours is a world in vertigo. It is a world that swarms with technical mediation, interlacing our daily lives with abstraction, virtuality, and complexity. Xenofeminism constructs a feminism adapted to these realities. So, like, yes, like, concretely rooted in the here and the now and the actual technical realities that real people face today. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty bold opening. This has, like, this Im immediate... Um, sense of being like uh you know as as you were saying Kyle a follow on in spirit from the accelerate manifesto um because it's also kind of going on about the like um you know it, it, re rejecting this like futureless repetition the, the the kind of repetition of the same over and over and over again and is calling for the same kind of uh, depetrification that um Williams and Cernishek were calling for in that um and it's just like the the language is so vibrant right like it's it's like crackling with energy and um yeah i i i think if there's one thing that they they take from accelerationism it is definitely that that critique of sort of like capitalist stasis um uh, that, that that rejection of like the accelerationist idea that capital is this a wonderful dynamic thing. Well, you know, the accelerationists also thought it was kind of a te techno nightmare, but that we should get on board with it, right? And and they're saying no, this is producing reification. It's producing repetition. Um, and uh, if you know, if we really want to achieve a kind of liberation, uh, we have to break with capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much into that. Um, yeah, Kira, yeah. what's your take? Yeah, Donna. On that note, um, Donna Haraway, uh, who I'm going to probably talk about a lot. I love her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> she's like one of my idols uh, for sure. She, um, in her book, "Staying with the Trouble," and and in Anne Singh's book, they they do also talk about um, ideas of how capital uh, capitalism is related to the Anthropocene and how. Capitalism has led us down this dark path of destroying the uh, the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know how capitalism led to you know logging in other countries and the destruction of habitats, which leads to our current like post habitat destruction state in America. And so uh, I saw a lot of that kind of in here as well, where they're talking about um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember where it was now. I think it's later on in the manifesto. So maybe it's discussion for further on, but, d d uh, Oh, scaling, um, how, you know, the scaling of capitalism is the destruction. Pro progress is not necessarily good. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I think this gets like to that idea of sort of like navigation, right? Like that it's, it's not enough to just move forward in any direction um it's we, we have to kind of think about you know when we when we think about uh progress like where is that progressing um right yeah. and and who who is it progressing for mm -hmm. like, like who who's benefiting from that progress yes. and, and in a capitalist structure it's a class issue so yeah, they right. focus on that a lot, which is a feminist issue because, you know, um, people who are other are hurt the most by capitalism. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so I guess moving on to uh, the second paragraph, which is perplexingly numbered uh, 0x01, um, we get into some of the some of the sort of meat of this, this sort of theory, right? They're like um, a kind of leaning into alienation and uh, a sort of rejection of naturalism. Um, and the, the, the opening sort of sentence is that uh, XF seizes alienation as an impetus to generate new worlds, right? And this relates to the title, right? That this is a, a politics for alienation, not necessarily one that's against. So Kira, yeah, what was your, what's your sort of impression of this bit, this kind of like uh, embracing alienation and of like this kind of, this kind of anti-naturalism? I love this part. Um, as as a, I love this whole thing, but um, I, I really identified with the rejection of the natural. Um, it's, it's part of why I love the cyborg manifesto so much. And in this, they're saying a lot of things. They're saying they're rejecting goddess feminism, which was popular in the eighties, seventies um, and eighties, uh, where you know women were connected to nature, and so we were we were good, right? And you know, f feminism, women women are powerful because we're natural. Um, and that was rejected by f further <laughs> forms of feminism, obviously, because natural does not necessarily mean good, and it doesn't mean it, it's it's a it's value neutral, right? Um, and and technological is not necessarily bad. So I like that they make that distinction here, and then kind of they, it's kind of a callback to the goddess feminism, and it's also um, as as a new I'm a recent vegan. I actually just went vegan this year. 
Um, and one of the arguments that I see a lot of vegans make is, oh, natural is better. Um, and that's not true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, as, as a vegan, you know, you, you want to find the best, most compassionate way to, to eat food, right? Not necessarily the natural way to eat food. Um, so, and, and, you know, uh, washing hands isn't natural. So, so I think, you know, just, just thinking for, for, for sanitation, you know, so that science is important and natural is not always good yeah and i I think um one of the things that's probably in in here as well i think it's maybe not in this section specifically but it's kind of seeped throughout the piece is that um there, there's, an, there's an acknowledgement that there, there is a sort of physical material reality and a sort of a bio reality beneath everything, but that's not the same as a glorification of that as a, as a norm, right? Like that um, when, we, when we invoke nature and this essentialist sort of naturalism, it's kind of um, uh, gesturing towards some sort of normative kind of idea of nature. Um, and that's, as you said, it's not, it's not actually good, right? Like it's, um, and I think the way they put it here it specifically is that the glorification of nature has nothing to offer us, the queer and trans among us, the differently abled. And yeah, I mean, like nail on the head, <laughs> that's precisely it. Like the, the nature sucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially there, it's a dangerous argument to make in queer and feminist theory as well, um, because the naturalism argument is often used against people like it's used for us and against us and lots of people have been murdered because we aren't naturally queer and lots of people have been murdered because we are so i think it, it, there is also like a callback to that concept um and they're they're saying natural is bad here so and that's that is that's actually a dangerous thing to say in queer theory so i thought it, i thought it was pretty bold it's very bold yeah um, and, and, you know, at the end here, this line, essentialist naturalism reeks of theology. The sooner it is exercised, the better. Uh, it's a very strong statement and, and absolutely <laughs> getting back to the goddess feminism that you were <laughs> referencing there, Kira. <laughs> there are some scalding hot takes in this, in this piece. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there great. are. <laughs> it's roasting. I, I love, it's absolutely a critique of different types of feminism, which I think is super, it's very meta. <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 Um, yeah, so uh, Kyle, do you want to lead us in on the next one? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so... This uh, 0x02 um, is about repurposing technology for progressive gender political ends, right? It's it's saying uh, XF seeks to strategically deploy existing technologies to re-engineer the world. Uh, Serious risks are built into these tools. They are prone to imbalance, abuse, and exploitation of the weak. Rather than pretending to risk nothing, XF advocates the necessary assembly of technopolitical interfaces responsive to these risks. Technology isn't inherently progressive. Its uses are fused with culture in a positive feedback loop that makes linear sequencing, prediction, and absolute causation impossible. Techno-scientific innovation must be linked to a collective theoretical and political thinking in which women, queers, and the gender non-conforming play an unparalleled role. And um, I think this is a, you know, really uh, of a piece with what we were discussing in transforming technology, right? Like the, that, that, that um, technology is political. And technology at the the level of design can assume uh, political ends, right? And so it is very important that the oppressed are participants and have a say in the design process in the direction of technological development. Um, and I, I think they really nail that in just just one paragraph here. It's really impressive. Yeah, totally. Um, I don't have much more to add to this. It's just like... Yes, we need to be, what is it, take control of the master's tools or whatever, mm-hmm. like Andre Lord says. Um, you know, a lot of technology comes from the military, um, and that's fine. But I think that if we were to consider, you know, women's health technology as one example, um, like, what, where would that come from? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we, we would... We would have to build it, and we we are building it. I'm actually a member of a a, a local biohacking group, wi- women's biohacking group in Columbus, Ohio. So I mean, I mean, they exist, uh, but yeah, I, th- I think that's a great statement. Just like we need to build more technology to support us. Yeah, and um, like for any for any listeners that are curious, like the what we were referring to there was the 
previous uh, series of three episodes on uh, the book of transforming technology, which um, goes into a lot more of the sort of theory of like, what exactly is it that um, in society dictates how technology is designed and, and what are the ways in which we could alter that design process to, um, to, uh, to emancipatory ends. Um, so this, uh, this is real thematic sort of resonance with, uh, with, with that sort of work. And then they follow up then with um, the, the next paragraph launching with like the, the real emancipatory potential of technology remains unrealized, right? That, um, that the, there, there is, there, there is this like potentiality in the present sort of state of affairs that is like systematically crippled and, um, and pressed down upon and, and, and repressed. Um, but the, the potential is still there. And this is, like, this is kind of, again, calling back to the Accelerate Manifesto, which made a very similar sort of argument that the technoscience we know in the here and now is not actually full technoscience as it could be. Um, this is uh, very much repressed and, and directed to very particular ends. And I guess, yeah, the, the argument here is for um, for unleashing that potentiality and, and uh, be something that can uh, can emancipate people of all... Uh, yeah, and it explicitly... Uh... It explicitly points out uh, the kind of environmental cataclysm that you're, you're mentioning there, Kira, this uh, Anthropocene uh, uh, issue. Um, and, and, and furthermore, I think there's a really important kind of second part to the paragraph, which is, you know, saying that um, gender inequality is characteristic of like the entire techno system from like the point of production through distribution to consumption, like the entire thing involves these inequalities um, and so there are places for interventions like all along the line design production distribution and like and in, in consumption yeah there remi- this paragraph reminded me of um that movie uh with the three black women who are working for nasa Mm. Um, in the fifties, I think, uh, to get, you know, the first man on the moon and like, um, that idea that like how, how women have worked with the creation of technology, um, has fluctuated over time and, um, you know, but it was always in a position of, of less power. So yeah, yeah. More power would be good. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I like that they, they point out that like, Hey, you know, yeah, design, uh, like, you know, women are I- excluded or marginalized in the design process, but also like, you know, there's so many female workers in the electronics industry who are producing technology day in, day out, um, but are, are, you know, like in the, in the, in the real sense of commodity fetishism, just completely erased from the, um, the final product that we receive, right? Like this is this is the, some of the worst paid, monotonous, and debilitating labor, as they say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and in game, you know, game designer, mm-hmm. I'm kind of up on the game tech, women in game technology and design, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, you know, just all the shit that's gone down recently with like firing of women in various various companies and. Um, you know, the lack of representation of even like playable lady characters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Like, I feel like that's like per- a perfect example. It's like gaming, which is kind of, I don't know, silly in, in a sense related to like a lot of the other electronic like missions, um, that we could be working on, but Oh, it's still very important, and 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 it has been very heartening this year to see. I mean, I <laughs> it's been disappointing to see the 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 continued um, harassment, and all, we're going to get into all that kind of stuff later in the manifesto. But uh, but I, it has been heartening to see that, like at the point of production, there has been more militancy, there have been more discussions, there has been more critical discussion in the in the games press about these issues and, and, and about just like, yeah, like women in, in, in the game's workplace and women in games themselves as, as characters and as themes. Absolutely. It's baby steps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like, um, there's another sort of incendiary, um, uh, paragraph coming up here where, um, mm. the statement is that xenofeminism is a rationalism. A a rationalism, not irrationalism, just in case that didn't come across. And that to claim that reason or rationality is by nature a patriarchal enterprise is to concede defeat. So this this is an argument for reclaiming the notion of the rationalism as a 
a genderless thing that humans have rather than being um, a pat- patriarchal thing. So yeah, like Kira, what's your, what's your take on this one? I love it. It's just like, you know, uh, how women are hysterical and irrational. And um, I was even watching, I think I was watching uh, the daily show or something today or interviewing a, a a lady politician, and she was talking about how Hillary had failed. Um, oh, as a writer, she was talking about her book, which was um, the like something about the world needs good angry women, and <laughs> how like women's anger, like you know, H- Hillary was too angry or not angry enough, and people didn't believe her, and like all this stuff, uh, and how that's like just a very gendered thing, like uh, you know, ang- anger. You know, women women are angry; they, they're not rational. Um, so to to state very clearly you know, feminism is a rationalism, I think is a, a big deal, you know, just point out like, Hey, this is rational. Genders other than cis men can be rational. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it's very cool. And I, 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 I feel like it's, um, and this, this is just a sort of impression from, um, sort of, uh, following sort of adjacent to kind of femme Twitter or whatever, but I've, I've noticed a sort of a resurgence in the kind of, um, I don't know, witchy sort of stuff or sort yeah. of people re- leaning into, the like it's and, and that feels again I, I can't really sort of comment because it's not not my sort of field but like it feels like it's leaning into the negative descriptor that's being assigned to you um like do, do, do you think that's the sort of case and is this sort of what they're trying to get at here as well oh gosh i don't i don't know i hadn't associated those two things before um i had more i mean you know uh, there is definitely popular witchcraft in like gender different gender communities and queer communities is like popular again. Um, and I think it's kind of as like a taboo expression a way to, um, you know, organize communities and, uh, yeah, ex- ex- express things that are, uh, are, are feminine. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, definitely anger, rage, uh, hexing, you know, hex the patriarchy. Like that. <laughs> but that's like a big <laughs> theme. Yeah. I mean, as, as like, as perhaps no, I mean, mm, uh, yeah. The the public hexing of Kavanaugh was something that gave me a lot of life, even if it is perhaps <laughs> slightly uh, a scientific. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, oh, yeah, that was very, uh, was very cathartic. That was very cathartic. Um, there were, uh, there were campaigns to hex, uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, when he was elected as well and like all, all kinds of political issues that come up and in a way it's a, it's awesome, uh, activism, like, cause it is getting a whole bunch of people th- thinking about the same thing, acting upon the same thing, and then maybe going out and doing something about the same thing. Um, so, and I mean, I've written, uh, Designer. I organized a, a, a cyber feminist uh, zine that has like games on like cyber witches and stuff like that. It's like a te- techno witch setting with like uh, cyber witchcraft and rituals you can do that are games, but that are actually feminist activism. Um, and that's that's like very much in line with like uh, a lot of Donna Haraway's thinking about uh, feminism and technology. Yeah. And like I, uh, I have I have so many thoughts about this. Um, I'll I'll try to be concise. Um, so I think one thing that uh, like we might point back to um, just from the run of this show is that um, you know one of the people we like to talk about a lot on this show is Stafford Beer, uh, who's of course a man, uh, but. Um, you know, Beer was involved in a in a very much a, a rationalist project of of developing you know cybernetic cybernetic methods for sort of increasing the um, the degree of freedom in society through uh, rational analysis. Uh, but he was also somebody who self identified as a wizard <laughs> and was a tantric, <laughs> and um, so like. Uh, I, I certainly would want to acknowledge that, like, that can cut across gender, right? Like, it, you know, um, so so whether, you know, you would identify as a warlock or a witch, there may be interesting uh, ways in which uh, these kinds of, um, I guess, kind of like non-modern ways of thinking uh, can can interface with rationalism and and. There's there's so much to be said about the origins of the Enlightenment and how it's considered connected to rationalism and how 
the development of the Enlightenment as an intellectual and political project interacted with ideas about magic and um, all that kind of thing. So, yeah, like, I mean, just look at Newton, right? Like, <laughs> that, that's a good example. Uh, the last thing I want to say is, like, that, that really stuck out for me about this paragraph is how it really um, reminded me of how, like, um, Descartes, who is, you know, considered to be sort of, like, one of the the most important and founding rationalist was um, very well received by a lot of women. Um, and, you know, that very much runs contrary to the narrative that um, irrationalism is feminine, um, right? Like that Descartes ideas about rationalism were taken up by women very much in exactly the way that they're describing here in this paragraph, right? That like, no, science is not an expression, but a suspension of gender. Like that, that idea was was absolutely um, a part of the Enlightenment. It's just one that I, I think was uh, very much marginalized as as it went on. And it's it's wonderful to see it come back here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this whole discussion reminds me of um, Philosophy Tube's latest YouTube video. Have you do you mm. watch Philosophy Tube? No. Um, it's, it's a YouTube channel run by uh, a fantastic gentleman, and he did a he, his most recent video was a takedown of uh, Kant. And he's like, is is philosophy just a bunch of cis white men jerking off? <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And it's really good because uh, it talks about like the lack of you know philosophers who are black or women um, in philosophy studies that are that's taught in school, and just like if if anyone who is other and taking taking those classes, like what what do they learn from a racist philosopher, you know, who Kant mm. was racist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. It's it's really interesting, you know. The, the history, history of Western philosophy is just a bunch of white cis dudes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it says here it is true that the canonical history of thought is dominated by men. Um, and, oh, as somebody who, like, did history of thought for my PhD, um, I feel that so hard. Like, I, I would, I would, I would go through my, like, list of people that were included in, say, like, the social networks I was drawing between thinkers, um, and I would go through my work cited or my bibliography and I just say like, th these are all men like this, this, this whole discussion is being held behind or about men and between men. And it would just, it just freaked me the hell out. Um, and so <laughs> I really love the, the, the sort of, um, uh, just very sophisticated attack that they have on that entire tradition uh, here in, in this paragraph. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's um, it's good stuff. And I mean, this is um, this this is dense writing, right? Like they're they're packing they're packing a lot into each 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 individual paragraph, um, and we're we're getting a lot out of it. <laughs> mm, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I suppose to move on to the next uh, the next section. Um, and this uh, this sort of opening paragraph, I think I, I read as being um, a kind of a call against the sort of modest localism and the kind of um, the kind of individual sort of struggles um, as being very kind of fragmented and not really up to the task of challenging capitalism in its sort of massively distributed and complex form. Yeah, um, I, I think the 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 sort of this is this is again very similar to. Accelerate Manifesto, uh, but I think the important point here is the excess of modesty in, modesty in feminist agendas of recent decades is not proportionate to the monstrous complexity of our reality. And I guess where I came out of this paragraph, I was kind of like, I'm not really sure how to evaluate that um, that statement, right? Like, does an excess of modesty... Um, characterize recent feminist agendas like I, I'm, I'm not really sure but uh, I, I, I in terms of a sort of a broad political project I'm very much on board with what they're saying here oh uh, yeah this this reminds me a whole lot of staying with the trouble this I feel like this mm. is Donna Haraway's paragraph because um, <laughs> like uh, staying with the trouble the whole concept of the book is that Oh, maybe he talks about this later in this manifesto too, but it's, it's kind of like about, um, how 
uh, you know, you can't, you can't be too, you can't be too hopeful or too despairing. You have to stay in the middle and stay with the trouble. Um, and you know, the, the, the ways that, you know, you can't, you can't just try to, to eat local or whatever, like you can't be a locavore and, uh, solve all the problems around you without seeing the complex intersections of what they're connected to, um, mm-hmm. and like what's causing them and how they interact with those things. It's a system. Um, and that type of like systemic thinking, it's kind of like a cloud. Um, it's, it's just very intersectional. It's very intersectional feminism. Yes. Um, so I, I think it's just talking about kind of like, uh, you know, you can't, you can't just try to, to fix your local, your, your local community or your local group. You have to like, kind of look at every single thing that's connected to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think we're all, all pretty on board with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, uh, it's just, Systemic thinking and structural analysis have largely fallen by the wayside in favor of admirable but insufficient struggles bound to fixed localities and fragmented insurrections. So she's talking about like kind of the the fractionalized groups that we have within uh, like feminist groups or queer groups um, that that can't find ways to kind of intersect and meet. And that's kind of an answered in the next paragraph by like um, this sort of in, uh, xenofeminism endeavors to face up to these obligations as collective agents capable of transitioning between multiple levels of political material and conceptual organization. So it's breaking out of that kind of localism and uh, and sort of like spreading in all directions across the uh, political landscape um, and through through all layers of recursion. It's a very um, the sort of imagery that's called to mind by this manifesto is often very. Um, very sort of viral or kind of like a, like a contagion that like xenofeminism is a sort of a, a virus that spreads throughout the system and, and takes it over at all levels. Um, yeah. Yeah. Which is quite nice. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> mm-hmm. Again, this is, it's this very vital kind of energetic style of writing. That's, that's, that's just sort of addictive in the moment. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. I completely agree. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Kyle, do you want to lead us in on the next one, zero seven? Um, I will just I will just say about zero six. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like this uh, claiming of the figure of Prometheus, mm-hmm. um, right? That uh, uh, you know Prometheus is being claimed here as a feminist figure, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, uh, yeah. So zero x zero seven. Um, says, uh, we are adamantly synthetic, unsatisfied by analysis alone. XF urges constructive oscillation between description and prescription to mobilize the recursive potential of contemporary technologies upon gender, sexuality, and disparities of power. Uh, Given that there are a range of gender challenges specifically relating to life in a digital age, from sexual harassment via social media to doxing, privacy, and the protection of online images, uh, the situation requires a feminism at ease with computation. Today, it is imperative that we develop an ideological infrastructure that both supports and facilitates feminist interventions within connective network elements of the contemporary world. Xenofeminism is about more than digital self-defense and freedom from patriarchal networks. We want to cultivate the exercise of positive freedom, freedom to rather than simply freedom from, and urge feminists to equip themselves with the skills to redeploy existing technologies and invent novel cognitive and material tools in the service of common ends. Um, (laughs) Yeah. I I think this is really, really strong. Uh This is very strong. That was it, my turn. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Uh, talk, talk, speak, speak to this. Uh, sure. Uh, this is complicated. Um, there's a few things that this made me think of. Uh, first, um, you know, a lot of social media, it's, it's dangerous to mm. be on as a woman or a trans person or a queer person. Like, or, for example, earlier this week, Patreon, uh, you know, for saying I had a, a, a sex story in one of my videos mm. and that suddenly I was adult content. Um, and the video was literally about, um, uh, non-binary gender. Like I was talking about my feelings on non-binary gender uh-huh. and this is so common. Like, um, uh-huh. the, the platforms themselves are 
you know, transphobic, homophobic, uh, you know, sexist, whatever. Uh, so, so, you know, especially for sex workers in those situations, like adult content, it, queer equals adult content, like on Patreon, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the system itself is patriarchal. It is oppressive because it is designed to to spot those things, right? Like it was a bot that spotted me <laughs> and then yes. turned me off. And then I had to contact IT to turn me back on. And that took a couple days. So oh. interesting, you know, and that's like my, my money. It's like my, my salary right now, basically. So they, they literally have control over that, those systems. And then, um, you know, to down to like, say, if you say anything, uh, about, um, you know, certain, certain community members in, in gaming, for example, mm. the, those people will like find you out and like, they'll just search for that person's name. And so you have to like use like not names if you're talking about it publicly. And, and usually the victims of these things are marginalized folks. And so, so it me, immediately made me think of that as like putting us on the defensive if we are to try and say anything or do anything publicly or, or any kind of activism, um, you know, it's, it's a huge risk. And instead of being on the defensive, this is saying freedom to rather than simply freedom from, right? Like freedom to speak about those things instead of freedom from being doxxed. <laughs> like, yes, exactly. That's, that's intense. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's a kind of... Um... This is a, a this uh, going on the offensive bit is a sort of a running theme throughout this piece, right? And it, it weaves and bobs in and out of a couple of different sort of topics. And closer to the start, it came up in the context of like naturalism, that um, for many sort of marginalized folks, an appeal to nature is often a sort of defensive sort of move in order to like try to try to validate themselves in the face of a um, adversary who insists on nature as the arbiter of all that is uh, is good and proper. Um, and that's the, that's that's the defensive footing, and the offensive footing is to say, well, well, fuck nature, right? Like it's to hell with nature. Um, and it feels like this is a kind of this is an alternation that weaves throughout the whole uh, the whole manifesto. Um, yeah, it's a very very mm -hmm. interesting way to weave these threads together. Yeah, and, and absolutely, a lot of the the harassment that happens on these online platforms is framed in terms of naturalism, right? Like the Jordan Peterson followers and so on that, that, that just make appeals to nature to reinforce patriarchy. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And even the fact that the platforms are trapped within capitalist structures, right. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's, that's a matter of survival that like to interact on those, those platforms, it's just bananas. So I think yeah. um, in some ways that this is um this the the the, the manifesto sort of strays into um not sort of troubling territory in this sort of way as well because it's sort of in one way saying oh well we should go beyond simply defending ourselves and go on the attack but then it feels to me and again with all the caveats in the world that this this isn't this isn't my sort of immediate lived experience but it feels like for a lot of folk in the here and now, like the defense is actually kind of nice because it allows them to continue to exist. You know, uh, does that, does that seem like a tension there uh, or am I, am I sort of just misreading it? Oh, I think, I think that that, I think that this is an idealistic proposition. Like, like what if we didn't have to go on the defensive um, mm -hmm. and, or how can we make it possible that we don't have to? And do you realize that we are on the defensive? I think that that's what it's talking about. Yeah, and, and I mean, I think like if you if you take that over to like things that relate to sort of like workplace struggles, it it is fine and good to practice like self care, right? That is a defensive mechanism you can use to exist in a capitalist world where your workplace is abusive. Uh, but that doesn't not negate the the notion of actually doing something so that uh, your workplace is not an abusive place and you can do work in a, in a good and positive way. And, and, you know, for a lot of people, social media is their workplace, right? Yeah. It's mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that this, this one's very personal, but, um, yeah. And I think, I think it's like talking about like, what if we, like it says, uh, you know, what if we were to equip ourselves with the skills to redeploy existing technologies and invent novel cognitive and material tools in the service of common ends? Like what if we were to create our own social networks? I think that's what that's saying. 
Yeah, and there's a lot to, lots to, to be said about the um, the efforts to to do that um, that are that are happening. Um, um, yeah. Um, so the next the next section uh, zero eight, I found a little sort of hard to read. I've, I, I sometimes get into this loop where I, I sort of read something and it just slides off my mind. It's like Teflon. Um, but I sort of read it as like a technical mediation and alienation for the many, not for the few. You know, that like kind of an, an argument for. Um, it's seizing control of, of the, these sort of technical uh, mediations and ensuring that they no longer simply serve the interests of capital, but, uh, you know, benefit the, the, um, the many instead. Um, which is, again, a sort of interesting way of, of, of framing all this, right? That, like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's not arguing against the alienation as such. It's that the, the, the alienation should actually serve everyone, <laughs> which I think is an interesting angle. Yeah, um, and I, I I think there there are other other points in this document to sort of talk about alienation. Uh, but I think one thing that's that's very interesting here is um, this idea that you know just because digital tools and digital technologies are sort of all pervasive doesn't mean that they're impervious to change. Um, it's it's trying to look at it like as they are changeable because we are in constant contact with them, right? Like there are so many points of contact between us and the technologies that we should look at that as an opportunity. And it's, it, I, I love this line, uh, just as the invention of the stock market was also the invention of the crash, uh, xenofeminism knows that technological innovation must equally anticipate its systemic condition responsibly. So yeah, the, the crash is catastrophic and 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 it really does uh cause us to suffer a lot uh it is a, it is a feature of the technology of like an organized stock market um but that doesn't mean that we should halt trying to reorganize the the system just because it is so um influential it's really quite quite the contrary right yeah this seems like the um like they're saying it's not a binary guys like, mm. Mm. <laughs> like you can, uh, we need to be critical of this technology, even if we're using it for good, you know, and like what, who is being affected by the expand technological expanse, you know, and they talk about, um, workers in Ghanaian villages and how they're dumping a lot of e-waste like in, in jungles and stuff there. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting. Like just to be, to, it's being critical of its talking about using technology yes yes yeah so um looking at the notes here i think on the next section as uh, 09 it seems like kyle has some thoughts <laughs> on this one yeah do you want to want to drag us in on that one uh sure yeah okay so <laughs> <laughs> this brings us into the tra- this brings us into the trap section uh, of the uh, of the manifesto, and uh, this is where the the fire really comes out. Um, uh, yeah, uh, some some searing hot takes uh, all all throughout here. So the first one is zero x zero nine. XF rejects illusion and melancholy as political inhibitors. Illusion as the blind presumption that the weak can prevail over the strong with no strategic coordination leads to unfulfilled promises and unmarshaled drives. This is a politics that, in wanting so much, ends up building so little. Without the labor of large-scale collective social organization, declaring one's desire for global change is nothing more than wishful thinking. On the other hand, melancholy, so endemic to the left, teaches us that emancipation is an extinct species to be wept over and that blips of negation are the best we can hope for. At its worst, such an attitude generates nothing but political lassitude and at its best installs an atmosphere of pervasive despair, which too often degenerates into factionalism and petty moralizing. The malady of melancholia only compounds political inertia and, under the guise of being realistic, relinquishes all hope of calibrating the world otherwise. It is against such maladies that XF inoculates. Boom. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So th- I think this is this is calling out two specific groups of people here, right? Like, uh, the, the first the section of this paragraph is calling out autonomous. Um uh, autonomous Marxists, uh, I would say primarily. So people like uh, Hart and Negri, um, uh, yeah, this is uh, this is a very fiery attack on on 
that kind of uh, just oh, yeah, just everything in autonomism. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> um, it's very very intense. Uh, and, and I feel like the second part is really kind of calling out people like I'd say Perry Anderson. Who is a quite quite influential and and, and prolific um, Marxist writer uh, who is just really known for his kind of um, glacial despair um, of, of his writing that just just you know realist to the point of of um, bleak analysis. So yeah, it's you know it's it's. Uh, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, but like very little on the optimism side, very much on the pessimism side. Um, and I, I feel like although that's that's often framed in terms of just, you know, being very intellectual, being very serious, um, it also does kind of slide over into a kind of melancholia. Right. And, and the dangers and comforts of melancholia. So that you have on the one hand, the ultra, you know, Pollyanna, um, version of politics that is promoted by Hart and Negri. And then on the other hand, you have the melancholia of somebody like Perry Anderson. Um, those people aren't being called out by name, but that's definitely who came up in my head when I read this paragraph. Yeah, this is agreed. Um, it, so this is like the most staying with the trouble paragraph. Mm. Um, like, I think in that book, she spends like an entire chapter calling out leftist academics and their like melancholy and despair and how it moves them to inaction and they don't actually do anything. And that's, mm. that's our, that's the trouble with the left. You know, it's like, I guess it's a very popular leftist politics, American opinion right now. Right. Mm, um, mm. but also reflected through, um, like feminist academics. <laughs> so, mm. <laughs> I mean, so it's also like a call out to like, I think, uh, Marxist feminists and like, um, you know, pe people that are like talking about how, how much, uh, like capitalism harms, um, you know, marginalized folks, but not necessarily doing anything about it because they're too sad. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. so, uh, well, it is a manifesto and it's, it's doing the manifesto thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I kind of like it. I, I yeah. Like that perspective to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> like, cause I'm not in any of those crews, you know, and just like, um, the fact that, you know, that, the, the, those people are being called out, I think, is kind of like, why are they being called out? Should I be aware of some kind of criticism surrounding these folks? Yeah, well, having been in sort of like the trenches of departmental warfare with um, autonomous, um, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is somewhat validating. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah. Anyway, um, it, it, it warms my heart, even if it is, um, even if it is just, you know, very, very, uh, very right going right for the throat. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, Kira, do you want to take the next one? Oh yeah. So this is going back to the, the communities They're refusing to think beyond the micro community to foster connections between fractured insurgencies, to consider how emancipatory tactics can be scaled up for universal implementation, is to remain satisfied with temporary and defensive gestures. XF is an xenofeminism is an affirmative creature on the offensive, fiercely insisting on the possibility of large-scale social change for all of our alien kin. Mm. I felt this one very personally, actually, because um, it, re it reminds me of trying to organize like feminist or queer groups and like mm. a lot of infighting that eventually like any like any group can have that not only feminists and queer groups have <laughs> mm. that can kind of um, kind of break down the, the bigger purpose of the group. Um, and, uh, it, it, it seems to be pointing towards kind of like the infighting thing again, fractured, fractured insurgencies, you know, um, how, how can we build something that's, that's going to be on the offensive to affect large scale social change instead of just affecting these small groups? Yeah. Like, do you, th do you think it's, um, it's also that like it, the, the, the problem here is that the, 
the micro communities and such are fractured precisely because they are not oriented towards like large scale social change. Is that is that the missing ingredient that's being proposed here? Is that an orientation towards a an attempt to take over the entire world, essentially? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's bold, right? This whole thing is pretty uh, radical. So it it does seem to kind of be saying that about small groups, like stop stop thinking small, think big. Like you you need to think of globally because that's the world that we live in, type of thing. Yeah. Um... Oh, uh, yeah, I also felt this very personally um, as as somebody who has been raised in a lot of hippie communities, um, calling out people for uh, suggestions to pull the lever on the emergency brake of embedded velocities. The call to slow down and scale back is a possibility available only to the few, a violent particularity of exclusivity ultimately entailing catastrophe for the many. That definitely speaks to all of my very weird feelings about hippie communities and, yeah, and hippie politics. Um, the, the back to the land thing, right? Um, yeah. And so that the kind of localism. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It reminds me of uh, queer um, communes too. Mm. Like um, in the eighties, a lot of queer communities or, or a lot of queer people were like um, f- just fighting to live on their own. And like, instead, cause it was like a separatism. Like we, if we can go live in our pocket over here in our commune um, mm. because we're not a part of your politics. Your politics don't support us. Your laws don't support us. So why should we be a part of you? It's very like a uh, anarchist, you know? Yeah. Um, and you know, it was only later that queer communities were trying to integrate again. And that's why we have gay marriage now. Right. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's interesting. I think she's in a way talking about that as it's, it's, it's really is your hippie community thing. Yeah, because there's totally overlap between those those communities, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, moving on to the next section, um, we we get the sort of the touch back on naturalism again. Um, oh, this is actually quite a long one. Um, I'm not sure if I can do justice to the whole thing, um, but it, <laughs> it, it opens with a rather um, a, a pretty good remark that like a um, a sense of the world's volatility and artificiality seems to have faded from contemporary queer and feminist politics in favor of a plural but static constellation of gender identities in whose bleak light equations of the good and natural are stubborn, stubbornly restored. So I kind of I kind of read this whole paragraph as being. Um, kind of admonishing that sort of thing of um, of, a, of of sort of turning away from the the radicalism of queerness and the sort of transformative potentials of that sort of stuff, and instead settling down for the naturalization of a a sort of fixed array of um, of identities, a sort of um, you know, in, again, in the face of that um, appeal to nature that the normies always make, the sort of bringing, oh, well, there's actually these other four things that are natural and, like, wanting those to be included in, in the circle of nature um, and sort of turning away from the uh, the radical nature-breaking uh, volatility of this thing. Um, but it's, it's a long one. There's a lot of... It feels like there's a lot of points here to unpack. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just wrote in my notes that, that like this 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 section qualified for me as like a nuclear hot take. If I were to touch it, I would immediately combust. Um, <laughs> it, 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 uh, yeah, very strong stuff being said here. Mm. So yeah, Kira, what's your take? <laughs> yeah, this um, I both there's some cringy things in this paragraph. That there are, uh, I love Dana Haraway and I love a lot of academic feminists, but their inclusion of like queer and transgender stuff is not always on par. Um, like they, I think they try really hard, but sometimes they lean a little bit too much towards women. Um, and, uh, as a non-binary person myself, Mm -hmm. I, you know, there's a few things where they, they talk about, um, uh, while having admirably expanded thresholds of tolerance, too often are we told to seek solace and unfreedom, staking claims on being born this way, as if offering an excuse with nature's blessing. So again, it's kind of talking about like, um, you know, it's 
are you born this? Like a lot of binary trans people would be really upset with that statement. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, they are born that, and a lot of a lot of queer people think they're born that way too. And I know it's bad. it's it's again that argument, uh, claim to nature argument, but it's it's still a lot of people think that and believe that, and that's that's fine and good. So I think an attack on that is a little weird. Also the. Um, when the way they talk about transitioning as kind of like a technological thing, I can't remember where it was. Oh, when the possibility of transition became real and known, it, it, it talks about it. the tomb under nature's shrine cracked and the new histories bristling with features escaped the old order of sex as though um, being trans is a totally new thing that happened with hormones and surgery you know? Um, so that's, that's a little like, well, that's not true, <laughs> but <laughs> trans, trans people have been around forever. Uh, it's just, you know, this, this makes the outward appearance different. Um, so those were a little like, eh. but I do love the, um, the concept of, of this where we get so trapped, especially in some, especially online, I think when we're talking about our identities and identity politics and, you know, oh, uh, all, all of the words that we use to identify our queer identities, for example, you know, um, and how, how quickly that language changes and how mm-hmm. we're kind of trapped up in the concept, those concepts where, you know, we're like this paragraph says all the while the heteronormative center chugs on, you know, and like we're arguing with each other over where over like what they them means. And, you know, cis culture, heteronormative culture is still doing its thing. And we need to stop mm-hmm. ha- arguing about identity politics and focus on supporting each other and fighting the fight. So I think this is definitely a critique of that. I see that a lot in queer conversations online and in queer communities where people are like, Hey, can we stop arguing about this? Can we stop hurting each other? Let's, you know, we all make mistakes. Everyone uses different language. It's changing very fast. We need to do our best and focus on, you know, helping our communities and getting legal rights and doing these things instead. Yeah, and that, that continues on in the next paragraph as well with um, like valuable platforms for connection, organization, and skill sharing become clogged with obstacles to productive debate, positioned as if they were debate. Um, so yeah, it seems to be really, really getting the knives out for this kind of like um, online culture. Of, uh, of <laughs> this, just... this, is, this, is some, this is some hot stuff. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah oh, boy. Especially the puritanical politics of shame, which mm-hmm. fetishize oppression as though it were a blessing and cloud the waters in moralistic frenzies, leave us cold. And like, I, I know this feeling. I know this yeah. feeling of like getting into arguments with like my feminist or queer friends, you know, or like getting accused of saying the wrong thing. And it's not just like a nice call out or a call in. It's like an, an arg- a heated argument. And like, it's, it's yeah. like, it feels like, it feels sad. It drains all of my energy. Yeah, it feels like a, wa- yeah. a waste of time. As if this person who is supposed to be, you know, who is ostensibly a comrade is your mortal enemy, right? Like, it's, um, yeah. And, and language oh, is important, but yeah, like, oh, man, this this line, these curatorial practices, come, with these curatorial practices come puritanical rituals of moral maintenance. And these <laughs> stages are too often overrun with the disavowed pleasures of accusation, shaming, and denunciation. And, yeah, it, oh, oh, yeah, it, it, okay, so I think, yeah, this is a thing that, like, it's kind of impossible to be online and not get caught up in. To some extent, and I think it's definitely a thing of like, yeah, being being kind with yourself and kind with others, and and and, and keeping perspective on your critiques. Um, and I think that's very much of a piece of the previous um, section, where the positive end of what they're saying there is kind of that it is possible to think about identity and sort of like the diversity of experience. Um, in a very positive way and it's possible to have an online discourse that supports that um, and I you know as a cis man <laughs> uh, there are a lot of experiences I have not had as a person that relate to queer struggles um, but there are certainly <clears throat> some kinds of language that is used online or that I've encountered that has caused me to 
think more in terms of sort of that like ontological variety we saw with Pickering, right? Like where, yeah, there is so much in this world, right? There are so many kinds of experience. Um, and to think about that in terms of like plurality and diversity in a very like open sense, um, uh, can be a lot more freeing and liberating than trying to fit yourself into rigid categories of what you ought to be. And, and, and I think that's kind of the, the, the positive flip side of, of what is being criticized here. So, yeah. So, yeah. There's something kind of dreadfully ironic as well in that, um, this, uh, and that they kind of highlighted in the opening remark that like cyberspace was supposed to offer this kind of like escape from these, uh, these bindings of identity categories, but that culture then ends up replicating the kind of, um, puritanical Calvinist sort of culture that it's rejecting as well by, um, by replicating the same kinds of witch hunts and um, shaming and denunciation, the same sorts of behaviors become a part of the new culture that, would, that they were trying to escape from the old culture. Let's, there's something absolutely bizarre about how that turns back on itself. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I was going to talk about the cyberspace line too. Um, the, I love how they make a call back to old cyberspace. Like, yeah. <laughs> like the cyberspace of the early nineties. And yes. like, that was actually, um, a bastion of, um, tra for trans people online mm -hmm. to meet and talk for the first time. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, meet other trans people, you mm -hmm. know, outside of their first place. It was kind of like, uh, what World War II did for gay people, like, um, mm -hmm. in America where, um, you know, gay people in the army or in the military moved around to city centers and met lots of other gay people for the first time. Um, and thus gay clubs were born. And right. so that's kind of like uh, a little bit what early cyberspace was like for, um, trans folks in America. I've, I've read and heard. Yeah. And this, this really feels like kind of, um, something that tracks the sort of life and career trajectory of Haraway, <laughs> right? Like, uh, <laughs> as a, as a major champion of the cyber, it, it, you know, in that sort of old cyberspace period and then seeing where it's at now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, also how social media is designed to make you in fight. Yes. A platform for debate. Thanks, Jack. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just this public knife fight, which, which everyone is reciprocally involved in. It's just, oh boy, yeah. like what a what a venomous uh, structure to be to be uh, <laughs> enwrapped in. Yeah. for coming along with us on this one. We really do appreciate it. Isn't it strange how such a short manifesto can turn into such a long recording? So we'll be back in a couple of weeks with part two of our discussion of the Xenofeminist Manifesto. In the meantime, you can find us on Twitter at GIUnitPod. We're on Facebook as General Intellect Unit. And if you want to support the show, you can go to patreon.com slash General Intellect Unit and kick us a couple of bucks a month. As always, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. <laughs>